Hello out there, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the Switch for Good podcast. I am Dotsie Bausch, and I'm here with my gorgeous co-host, Alexandra Paul. Hi, Dotsie. Hello. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, so, Alexandra, something pretty cool and crazy happened in the news very recently. Um, the Journal of New York University's Women's and Gender Studies program uh, has published a paper that insists that milking cows is comparable to sexual abuse. Mm. Um, strong, but... That's huge yeah. for it to be a paper printed that actually acknowledges that animals can be abused in the first place, and especially right. livestock, right? Right, <laughs> absolutely. And um, it, it came across... Uh, the screen for me because, um, interestingly enough, um, and I was also quite honored, they brought in um, Switch for Goods work into their into their paper and to the forefront, um, giving a nod to our 2018 um, anti dairy Olympic commercial. Oh, so that's why I got to even see this. But um, so the author uh, writes, you know, that throughout our lives we're an offered this like idealized image of dairy cows, right? The, the beautiful cow, happy cow, the happy cow. And they're grazing in these beautiful pastures and they have room to sow and play. And they're, they're comforted in spacious areas with which to sleep. I think they even have us believing that they massage them at night and they put their heads down on lavender scented pillows. <laughs> um, and we're, pre but we're presented these images, right? Of a life well lived on the front of the dairy cartons, Right there, looking at us with the bell and their neck. And a um, nice farmer with the overalls. Right, right. Uh, but this, this, this paper um, really turns all of that on its head. Um, it, it points out specifically that the dairy industry is a host for sex-based discriminations. It is a site where sexual assault and objectification based on biological makeup are highly prevalent but ignored as we choose to neglect non-humans with whom we share the planet. And the author makes what I think is um, a really strong, um, prominent, and very important conclusion, where she says, while we fight against the sexual abuse of women, why are we still allowing the same treatment to be thrust upon other living bodies when there are other more sustainable ways to live that do not involve harming millions of female bodies? With simple lifestyle changes that promote reproductive justice towards animals available to many, why are we picking and choosing which pots of capitalism, sexism, and patriarchy to stir when we could dis dismantle it all? That's pretty powerful. I know. And I love that she actually uses the word rape because a lot of people are afraid to use that in terms of animals because they're worried that they'll diminish the rape of human women. Yeah. And I think it's really important that it's acknowledged the brutal, brutal way that uh, dairy cows are treated. And they are forcibly impregnated every to every year. Yeah. So call it what you want. You're misty-eyed over there. Yeah. Me too. Yeah. Oh. Well, this, um, this paper, this report, this subject um, has some relevancy to our incredible next guest. Yeah. So tell us who's with us. Is so James Aspie is our guest today, and what really moves me about him is his honesty and his passion. Uh, he has survived cancer, drugs, and food addiction, and thank goodness, because now he is much loved and a respected activist who travels around the world as a public speaker, helping people transition to veganism and inspiring activists to communicate effectively for animals. And he was once a personal trainer who told his clients they had to eat meat. But then James took a vow of silence for a year to raise awareness in his native Australia about how animals are treated. James also rode across Australia to show that you can be strong and athletic eating plants, which is just exactly in line with the Switch for Good Foundation, right, Dotsie? Um, so coming to us from Canada, where I'm sure he is reaching a lot of people with his very wonderful talks, thank you, James, for being on Switch for Good with Dotsie and me. Thank you so much for having me. It is such a pleasure to be here with you both. And can I just say the intro that I was just listening to you both talk about, that paper that came out, that really that gave me goosebumps to hear that those, those female bodies, those innocent beings, those dairy cows are being acknowledged and not just in some sort of watered down way, but it is being acknowledged for what it is, sexual abuse, of 
of women's of female bodies and it I completely agree I'm so I was so grateful to hear you call it what it is it is rape there is no consent when these beings are being forcibly impregnated it is always against their will and I think you also touch on a very important point that people don't want to use that word because they feel that it may diminish the experience of human rape victims but that's not at all what it's doing we're just elevating the non-human victims to what they also rightly deserve they also deserve their stories to be told the way that it actually is and I'm, I'm, it was just such an excellent thing to hear you both talk about so thank you so much for sharing that story yeah i think a lot of people feel um you know maybe who have been a victim of rape that it's very triggering of a word and of course it is as it as it, as it should be and then but how can we turn that triggering into action mm-hmm. by dropping animal food yeah from like our what plates? i like what james said about it. we're just we're not denigrating anything we're actually no. trying to elevate other victims so that they mm-hmm. are also seen and heard mm-hmm. which is and what you're is doing triggering. yeah it, it, it is triggering and that is you know nobody wants to trigger anybody by speaking up for other victims it's it's so unfortunate that that is also something that happens to these victims afterwards that they're re-traumatized mm-hmm. um and i don't have the perfect answer for it but i don't believe that the answer is to not call it what it is even though that does come with certain issues you know there, there doesn't seem to be a perfect way to do it but i think overall the right thing to do is to not water down for the current victims of what is happening not watering it down by calling it something else if we don't call it rape people will think that it isn't rape otherwise we would have called it that and I don't think that's the right approach to take um, because I, I think that is is um, I don't, not selling out of the victims but it is it's not it's not the right justice it's not full justice for those beings mm-hmm. well one thing I think is empowering is that when we have something bad happen to us our first a lot of the motivation to healing is to help others not go through the same thing so one of the things that humans can do is help these voiceless animals not go through what they went through and yes i am comparing it um uh, so maybe that is an empowering thing for human rape victims to not partake in this raping of other beings uh in the dairy industry mm-hmm. i want to talk about to move to you james because You've actually uh, empowered yourself, too, by speaking out for others. Um, And you experienced, when you were a teenager, some really traumatic things. You were diagnosed with cancer at age 17, which is huge. And the doctors basically told you that you would die within six weeks unless you you didn't start chemo right away. And that must have been really hard on you emotionally and physically, uh, yes, it was. <laughs> an understatement, it was probably, right? <laughs> it was probably just as hard on my family, if not harder at times on my parents, especially. But I'm so, so grateful for that experience. I'm so grateful that I did suffer so much. It definitely helped me connect with the suffering of others. I wasn't really able to relate to it much before. I actually think that's a big part of the reason why so many people don't go vegan straight away because what we're talking about what is happening to these animals we're talking about them getting their throat slashed open and all these horrific mutilations and just suffering at the greatest level that most humans have never even come close to experiencing and neither have i but at least from having cancer and really going through a lot of a lot of pain what what happened to you? How did you find out what kind of cancer and what was that? What did it feel like when the doctor said that word to you? Uh, well, I started off with a small lump, like a little marble in my neck. I was on my way on a school excursion for a few days and I was sitting next to my health teacher who was a friend of mine at the time. And he was always about get things checked. If you see something, just get it checked. So I, I said, oh, look, I found this little lump. He said, yeah, you should get it checked. I said, yeah, I will, because you always say that. 
And I got it checked and they said it was nothing and I felt fine. And pretty soon that had turned into about 13 golf ball size lumps in my neck, oh. under my arms, in my groin. And, you know, it was, I looked very strange to have so many large lumps under my neck. So they did a biopsy and it came back inconclusive. They said I had glandular fever and then soon later, I couldn't sleep because I'd wake myself up from snoring straight away as the lumps were uh, getting in the way of my breathing. I went into hospital, they took one out from under my arm. At this point I was so healthy, I was a black belt in karate, I was still training inside the hospital uh, and there'd been no talk of anything serious. And after about five days of being in hospital, I was in there doing push-ups and chin-ups, a whole <laughs> bunch of doctors and nurses came in and I looked, I thought, okay, this doesn't look very good. And they said, James, we've got cancer. We're not sure exactly what type yet. We just know it's very aggressive. And you can have the weekend to go and pack your things and have some fun and see your friends. But on Monday, this is on a Friday, on Monday, everything has to start. We have to start immediately. And to be honest, my first thought, this had happened in the, in the long break holidays over Christmas. And I had a lot of homework to do and I wasn't doing it. I was telling my mom, I'm like, no, nah, I'm not going to do it, mom. What if this is something serious? You know, I don't want to waste my holidays doing homework if it's something serious. Just, just trying to get out of it. I didn't actually think it was something serious. And then my first thought was honestly, I am so glad I did not do those assessment tasks. <laughs> I was so happy. I was like, yes, I knew I was right. <laughs> and um, So you and, went through you know, chemo for three years. I did. I, I did six months of very heavy-duty, intense chemotherapy, which, you know, just knocked me around so much. Yeah, I had six months intense chemo. I lost my hair. I put on about 50 pounds so fast, actually, that the skin on my sides ripped and bled. I have very thick stretch marks on my sides and um, different parts of my body. Uh, I got pneumonia in a central line that was inside of me. They didn't know where the mm. infection was for a long time. That was a very, very close call. Different reactions to the chemotherapies, serious pain um, through different reasons. And yeah, then I had a little bit of a break for a few months and then I was to start two years of once a week chemotherapy, which turned out to be about three years because I couldn't always do it again the next week because I was still kind of sick from the week before. Even though at this time, by then I had um, I had started doing a, a personal training course and I was out there and I was partying a lot. I thought I was going to die. So I was like, cool, if I'm going to die next week, I'm going out with a bang. And I was partying and the easiest way I knew to have a good time was to take a lot of drugs. So I was taking a lot of drugs at the time. This all led to different issues and problems, although also a lot of different lessons and um, you know, I'm grateful for all that too. But yeah, the three years of chemotherapy was, it was a long time. And, you know, I'm just lucky that I don't, all I have to show for in terms of negative side effects is um, mainly some stretch marks. And that's really not so bad at all. I, it's actually funny, you know, that was when I was 17, I'm 32 now. Because of those stretch marks on my arms, I would shrug my shoulders to try to cover cover them with my sleeves and I, I've had a neck problem for e ever since but I never realized it was that that I from shrugging my shoulders and I've literally just healed a problem that I've had with my neck literally every day I've been in pain it's been so limiting it's, it's kind of been a bit like a disability it's been so limiting in my life of exercise I can do and just how much pain I'm in every day. And I've just healed that in the last three months because I went back to that time I had cancer, realized what I, was, what I yeah. did when I first started having a problem with my neck and then um, realizing that I was still shrugging my shoulders. If you look at my videos on YouTube, you can see my shoulders are shrugged. And since then, I've spent a lot of time dropping them back down through stretching and exercise and finally, this constant pain that I've had is finally gone. So I'm extremely, extremely Whoa, what a relief. happy about that. Yeah, oh, congrats indeed. on getting to the bottom of that. My God, That's I thought like freedom. I, you know, I, I've spent so much money on mine trying to fix it. I've seen so many people. I had just reserved to the fact that I was always going to be in pain for the rest of my life. And so to come out of it, and I'm just extremely, extremely happy. 
One of the <laughs> other things that came from your ordeal with chemotherapy is that you became bulimic um, and started binging and purging. Uh, mm. And Dotsie and I are both recovering anorexic slash bulimics. And p- one of the things we discuss on the show is disordered eating, mostly because most Americans have disordered eating because they're eating a standard it American is. diet full of addictive uh, foods like salt, sugar, fat, mm. uh, processed. And so, sure. uh, so can you talk a little bit about your bulimia? I, I heard you say oh, that it was it. the biggest ordeal, the biggest... Oh hurdle that that you overcame and with your history that's probably surprising to a lot of people that you would consider it even more difficult than going through cancer and your struggle with mm. drugs mm-hmm. certainly the, the thing that was hardest about it was that i i desperately desperately wanted to come out of that addiction that food addiction and i just was i'd never felt so hopeless in my life and it, it I just thought, I, I will never come out of this. I've mm-hmm. tried, I've tried, I've tried, I can't. This is me now. So that stemmed from when I was in hospital, I was on a very high dose of steroids and those steroids led me to eating a uh, high excess of food. I was constantly eating. I was sleeping two hours a night for well over a month and just the rest of the time I was eating. And I, that's why I put on so much weight so fast. That's why I, my stretch marks ripped on my sides. And so it was chemo I, with the um, steroids. Because when you said you gained 50 pounds on chemo, I thought, well, that's, I've never even heard that. Everyone always loses a ton of weight. But the steroids were having the opposite effect. Making they make you, you very hungry. Really hungry. Yeah, I believe okay. that was it. And I always had a great appetite. So for the, the mo- you know, as the majority of people probably do lose their appetite, I was smoking a lot of cannabis at the time. And, you know, I started doing that when I got out of hospital um, the first time. After a long ordeal of chemo, I was like, I'm getting out of here. I'm smoking so much weed. That's pretty much all I could really do. So it wasn't to deal with the chemo that, that you were smoking weed. You just were smoking weed because... <laughs> Because I was 17, I wasn't allowed yeah. to do anything, and I was I I just thought I deserve some enjoyment, and I thought that was a way to get it. Yeah. Um. With with having so few options, I wasn't allowed to see many people. I wasn't allowed to go out anywhere. I was very uh, not not isolated. People could come and visit me, but I was awake all the time. Just like, okay, what am I going to do? I'm stuck in my my house or in the hospital. Um. So yeah, I was just doing. It. I also heard that it may be therapeutic in different ways for the trick, the symptoms that I had. Mm. So, but mostly it was just purely out of boredom. And, um, and so also cause I thought I could get away with it. Um, because earlier I went out, you know, at this time I was 17 before that, there was no way my mum and dad would let me smoke weed. And at this time they did not like it at all, but they were less inclined to force me not to. Right. And they let it know that, let me know that they didn't like it at all. And they didn't want me to do it. But I was like, you know, I deserve some leniency. I think we all agreed on that. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so because I was on such a high dose of steroids, I believe that's what contributed to the massive weight gain and also eating for the wrong reasons. I'd stopped eating just because of hunger. I was eating now because of boredom. I was eating because the, the taste was some pleasure that in a day filled with pain and suffering and, and no fun activities. And I just started eating for the wrong reasons. And that became a new addiction. I was eating to satisfy cravings. I was eating because I wanted to distract myself and creating all these new reasons to eat. All these, yeah, all these new reasons to eat. Um, Aside from the only reason to eat because you are feeding your body the nutrition it needs, the fuel it needs. This turned into a serious binge eating disorder. I just couldn't stop. I would eat until I felt so disgustingly sick, fairly regularly. It got more and more regular as the addiction grew stronger, as the more I succumbed to this craving. And at some point, I felt so sick that I felt, oh my God, I need to vomit. I actually can't keep this food in my stomach. I think it was after a Christmas meal. And I vomited and I felt a little better. I thought, whoa. I feel better. I ate all that food and I don't feel that bad right now. Plus all the calories, you know, that's nice to have out of my body. I know that's not good for me. And then that just triggered that basically, you know, it wasn't for me a body image thing. Um, like I am aware it is for many people, 
But for me, it was purely about the food addiction and being able to just give myself the ability to eat as much food, to, to continue the process of feeding my face, feeding my face. That was my addiction. And this got pretty out of hand uh, to the point where, you know, sometimes I'd be binging and purging. I mean, I, I think at its worst, it was probably, you know, at least half a dozen times in a day. And I'd still get nutrition, but then I would binge. And when I would do that, just the taste, the taste of refined sugar, a, a, a portion of a square of chocolate. If I, if I had that, it was all over. That's my day over. Cancel my plans. I'm not going to be able to go anywhere because I'm going to about to eat so much food now, out of control eating, that I'm not going to be able to go see anybody or do anything fun later. I'm going to feel disgusting and I'm going to sit here feeling so ashamed and sorry for myself that I wasted all this food while children are starving in other countries and I don't have control over this. It's something so mundane as being able to eat food, like how pathetic of me. And, and I'm you a were a personal, personal trainer at the I'm time. I'm a personal trainer trying to teach people how to eat and I'm literally telling them how to eat as best I knew, which was terrible advice anyway at the time. But because the you were time, telling you know, them to eat meat. So I, I was telling them they had to eat meat and dairy mm -hmm. and eggs. Mm -hmm. I had no idea. I, so many people are confused about nutrition. I was just another one of them. What were you, what, what was the pain that was going on? Did, what, you know, I, the, the story resonates very deeply with me because mine, uh, my eating disorder as well was not connected to body image whatsoever, but mm. a way to act out on inner pain. What was it? Was it the, the pain and agony and sadness of the cancer? Or was it, no, was it, was, it, it was something actually else? nothing like that. It was the addiction to the sensation, the mm. pleasurable sensation of eating, the, the action of eating. Okay. I was addicted to eating, okay. to putting, uh, putting something in my mouth and chewing it and tasting it and swallowing it and filling my stomach and continuing that process. I was addicted to the sensation, the pleasurable sensation I would get from eating food. But it's like did a drug. It, uh, but did it... It was just a drug. It, well, it, I mean, yes, food had become my drug. I'm going to um, challenge you on this, though, James, because what what I've heard you say is that you gave up binging and purging the day that you committed to animals and you, you committed to your year-long silence. So that lends me to believe that it might have been a lack of purpose in your life no. and meaning. No? <laughs> I, I can totally understand why you would come to that conclusion. Okay. But allow me to further explain. Yes. So... This became such a huge problem in my life, the biggest problem in my life. I, I felt like such a sham as a health coach. I felt disgusted in myself. I felt so out of control. I was so disappointed. I felt hopeless, like there was no way to come out of this. And just desperate, but also basically giving up because what else do I do? I've read books. I've, I've wrote affirmations. I've... I've um, restricted all junk food. I've tried different dieting approaches. What, do I, what else do I do? I'd never even thought to seek professional help. I just it didn't even cross my mind. Nobody, not a single soul knew that I had this issue, um, except for maybe one girlfriend I had at the time. I think she caught on to it at one point or she had a suspicion, but I don't know if it was ever confirmed. And anyway, that was just whatever. So potentially one person, but I never told anybody. It was too much shame. Mm -hmm. I, I had too much pride in myself to let other people know that I was suffering in such a way. And um, what happened eventually is that I worked on a cruise ship. Um, this is my seventh year as a personal trainer. And I was introduced to the idea of meditation, something I'd already dabbled with quite a bit, but I became motivated to do a meditation course called Vipassana which is a 10 day long meditation course. You don't speak for 10 days, you meditate for 12 hours a day. I actually just finished my ninth course two days ago, which was phenomenal. But anyway, that's another story. And so this technique, this technique that they teach you is about observing your physical sensations and not reacting to them, which is exactly, exactly what I needed to come out of my addiction. No matter what your addiction is, if it's cigarettes, if it's sex, if it's television, if it's anything, you get a craving and you react to it. And so what I was learning is to have a craving for food but not react or, or just observe it instead of succumbing to it. 
instead of running to, to get rid of the craving by having my drug or instead of distracting myself by other things so I wouldn't have to deal with my craving. Instead, I started facing this discomfort in my body and I started coming out of my addiction. This was the process. This still took another year before I came out of it. And then I read a book soon after this course called End Emotional Eating by Dr. Jennifer Tates. I read the back of this book before I bought it. I'm like, oh, another book. I've, I've read them. Like, it doesn't help me because I've just done this meditation course. And then I read the back of this book and it was, it was basically the meditation course I'd just done designed for people with addictions to food. Mm. Perfect. I read it and I knew straight away, this is it. This is, this is the key. What is in these pages is going to be how I come out of it. And I read it and it was, I, I didn't come out of it still straight away, but I knew now I have, I have the techniques to work with and now it's just a matter of time. Being able to sit with that discomfort longer and longer before I run to the food, longer, longer, and to the point where sometimes it would just fade and pass and I wouldn't have had to get food at all. Eventually I just built my, built my strength in these sensations that once would always run me to the fridge and to the supermarket to buy a, a ridiculous amount of generally junk food. They started, I started becoming, being able to sit with them and get stronger and stronger. And then when I was coming out of it, coming out of it, knowing I had something to work with, the day I started my vow of silence is the day I said, from this day on, I'll never consume any animal products. And I'm ready now to take another pledge. From this day on, I'll never binge and purge again. And about a, less than a week later, I was alone. I was doing my vow of silence. I just started. I felt lonely and I went to food, which was still something I was using as a drug to make myself feel good. I got a tub of vegan ice cream, a liter of vegan ice cream, and I ate that whole thing with half a tub of peanut butter. Wow. And, and that is just the most delicious combination. <laughs> And I, I ate this whole thing. I felt as disgusting as you can imagine, having so much junk food in my stomach all of a sudden, so much fat. I felt so heavy. And I I thought, oh, God, it would be nice. You know, I could so easily. I would never have thought twice about it before. I was going, boom, bomb it straight back up. But this time I thought, yeah, it would be so easy to do that. But you know where that path leads. You've been on that path for however many years now. You made, you made a vow. You made a lot of vows that day. And what, you're going to break this one, so you're going to break the other ones too? You're going to start talking again at some point this year? You're going to stop being vegan at some point this year? No. All these vows are equally meaningful. A vow is a vow. And so I sat with the discomfort, and oh, I hated it. I hated it. And I woke up the next morning, and all, I felt better, but I still felt like, ugh, I can't believe all that. It just stayed in my stomach. I never would usually keep it in my stomach. It would always usually come back up. And it was so uncomfortable. And I just thought, wow, okay. Well, at least it was better than what I would usually do, purging it back up. So it was it was still progress. It wasn't perfect, but it was progress. The next time when I binged, I was 95% into my binge. And then I thought, you know what? Although I'm already 95% in, it's still better to stop at 95% than 100%. I could still have a few less chocolate biscuits. And it's it's... It's going to still be better. Yeah. And then the next time I binge, it was a little better and a little better. And over time, I, just, I stopped having the will to binge. I knew I was going to feel disgusting. I, I thought that disgusting feeling is worse than me sitting with the craving of binging in the first place. That's the point it got to. And, yeah, I mean, I never binged and purged again these days. I would like you to try to find someone who has a better relationship with food than I do. I only eat when I'm hungry. I stop when I'm full. I eat only the healthiest, only the healthiest whole foods. I, I, um, you I'm don't have, so when you're emotionally it. uncomfortable, you don't think of food anymore to go to? Are you able? Absol absolutely not. I have a technique to use now, the Vipassana meditation technique. Um, I don't need food anymore. I, I, yeah, basically, it is just, it's like it was, uh, it's like my cancer, just completely in my past. Mm. I've been in remission for 15 years, mm. you know, completely. There's been no trace of any, any complication ever since. Like a flu I had is how I look at my 
eating disorder now. It is just, there is, you know, you mentioned that you're both recovering. Um, and I would just never use that word for myself. I am recovered, completely recovered. I think recovered. Dotsie feels she's recovered. I don't I'm feel you. I'm recovered. And Dotsie, yeah, interesting. Still, I mean, you had we're going to actually have, we're going to have a contest later to see who's more recovered, you or me, because I'm with you, buddy. 20 years that of just epic. not a second yeah. of food being a demon and, in my life. And Dotsie actually had the right. same, you have the, you had used the same technique as mm-hmm. James did yep. with her therapist, and which I, I thought was interesting. You both found your therapy, your, this kind of technique in a bookstore <laughs> because she she saw a flyer about a talk in a bookstore and um, and you read this book which helped you of course you learned it first through through your meditation but um, but you had the blue dots that you uh, for our listeners who want to hear more about Dotsie's journey that we I did interview Dotsie um, a few months ago and you can learn more about but the same technique about you putting a <clears throat> dot down and then yeah, and sitting then with the feeling even if it's for five seconds and, 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 and diving into it and locating it in my body and it's, it's walking through the meditation perfect. with it perfect that mm-hmm. is that is I think the way to do it if your problem is and it generally is you're, you're reacting to these sensations of craving mm-hmm. or you have a craving of discomfort and you, re, you think the best way to react to that is to go and numb it with food or mm-hmm. whatever drug it is. Either way, the actual technique to come out of those reaction patterns that are causing you suffering is to observe them and become comfortable yeah. with this discomfort. And then you don't need to run here or there. You can just sit with it. And as every sensation, every craving that has ever come to you they're all impermanent. They will all pass. So there's no need to run. It will pass in its own time anyway. And when it passes, it's it's not throwing you up or down. You can just be with it and be strong, be solid and stable um, no matter what, no matter what comes up inside of you. Yeah, I, I felt a, a complete departure and release of my eating disorder through the hard work that I did. And I was... Um, healed a hundred percent before, even before I found veganism, whole food, plant-based diet. But I will say, Mm. and I want to ask you this question. um, I do feel this extraordinary overarching, complete and total freedom in my food these days, because I'm going around 10 years now of of being whole food, plant-based, that is possibly part of the reason that my journey continues in recovery. I'll never know because I'm not going to go back to eating animals to see, to check it out and see if it's, <laughs> but there's just this, this, this feeling of obviously purpose every single moment that I eat, which is five or six times a day. Sometimes that I'm choosing love and compassion and not the other. Um, but I also have this feeling and, and sensation and it's the, the wonder of what you were saying where I only ever eat when I'm hungry. I only ever eat what I decide I want to eat. Like I don't have any mm. rules. I'm not weighing mm. anything. I'm not counting anything. Like it's just yeah. this gorgeous freedom in mm. pursuing plants and not animal yes. food. So do you feel like that in, in relation to your eating disorder at all? What was I, your eating disorder, obviously, part of your past? I feel... Total freedom to eat what I choose, and by that I mean I want to be the healthiest vegan I can bl- can be for myself and for the cause. I think that's very important to show that this can be a very healthy lifestyle, the healthiest. And I think a good way to represent that is through your own physical health. Mm-hmm. So now, how I know that I have got it covered is because I don't slip up. I don't oh, there's some chocolate cake there. I'm just going to have some. I, I do allow myself to very occasionally if I really want to, but it's always a choice and it's never a, because of this sort of strong desire. It's just like, you know, maybe it's just sort of the social thing to do at the time. Someone makes a cake and it's like polite to have a bite. But um, aside from that, mm-hmm. I, I it's purely all choice now. And so what I choose is the highest quality foods that I know, a whole food, plant-based diet. I limit my fats um, so I don't consume oils. You know, I, I do occasionally if there's some there and it just, you know, that's the practical thing. Like I'm not crazy about anything, but I have general guidelines to follow. Um, there are always exceptions to the rule, but general guidelines to follow that I follow easily. It's not a stressful thing for me to eat perfectly healthy 
and to consume the right amount of calories and I don't eat too little, I don't eat too much, I eat when I'm hungry, it's very casual, I don't count my calories either and I'm in perfect health, the healthiest I've, I've probably, oh, for, certainly the healthiest I've ever been in my life um, and it's effortless, absolutely effortless. So yeah, it's, it's um, and in regards to how I feel when I eat a meal, I, I feel so, so incredibly grateful to be aware of the horrific way that animals are exploited, abused and slaughtered for animal foods. And every meal, yes, I'm extremely grateful that it is a plant-based meal, that it is the meal that is causing the least amount of suffering to myself, the animals, and the planet. And yes, of course, through that knowledge, you do feel a sense of purpose um, and, a, and a, yeah, a sense of duty to share these meals, to share this lifestyle with others because we are so blessed with this information that how could we not share it? It's too good a gift not to share with everyone else. So you you now speak around the world about two vegans, encouraging them to become activists, and then also teaching us how to communicate uh, effectively with people who are non-vegans. And there are so many people who struggle with food and mm -hmm. in terms of getting rid of the meat and the dairy, even though they say they they love animals and they want to quit, <clears throat> they seem to be unable to. What do you say to people? How do you help people? What are three tips you can give to someone who might be listening who is trying to get off animal foods? I think it's really important that people start where they're comfortable. Some people are so motivated that they want to go vegan overnight and you can assist them to do that. But I also think it's very important for somebody who was like me, who had no intention, no care for animals, no intention to ever, ever stop eating meat. I didn't even see it as a possibility to try a vegan meal and just see that you will enjoy it. It will fill you up. Um, you will feel satiated and you will feel energy like you'll get everything you need from it just start somewhere some people go vegetarian first some people do meatless monday some people stop eating animal products for breakfast and they do lunch when they've got it sorted some people do a 22 day vegan challenge like challenge 22 there's so many different ways to start and let's say that you do start by doing a 22 day vegan challenge and you get 10 days and then you throw it away no, this is too hard. It's not for me for whatever reason. I'm too busy. Don't, don't, don't think that that's you failed and that's it. You can't do it. Imagine if I felt like that with my eating disorder, with my neck after all these years. Try again. It's for you. I guarantee it is for you. It is for everyone. And did just you go keep all the, at once? Did you? Did you go cold no, turkey? No, I went vegetarian overnight, and then um, it took me over a year to go vegan. I was addicted to dairy, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. I had a serious addiction to dairy through my food addiction and also the casomorphins in dairy that actually are like an opiate mm -hmm. addiction. Mm -hmm. So it was a very real thing. It took me a while, and then I had to make a decision. From this day on, I'm never knowingly consuming an animal product again. It took me a while to get to that point. That's okay. Like, I'd rather people take a little bit longer to get there but then get there and sustain that rather than try in an unsustainable way, fail and think it's not for them. It's for you. So just do it in the way that you need to do it in order to make this a permanent lifestyle change. Um, other things I would suggest to people who are trying and not really getting it or motivated but don't know where to start, join some vegan Facebook groups or some vegan forums uh, and just see the, the questions that come up, the troubles that people have, ask your own questions in there, the things you're struggling with, if it's recipe ideas or if it's what, what vitamins may I be missing or what do I do if I go to this restaurant, this, what do I do at Mexican restaurants or whatever it is, ask your own questions. All your objections, all your excuses not to be vegan, all your problems that you have, we've all had them and we've all come through them. And now being vegan is completely effortless for all of us. It's, you know, I mean, for all of us who have come through that, it's it's no harder than any other lifestyle choice. In fact, in some ways, it's so much easier because there's so much motivation behind it. 
Um, but to get to that point, it might take you a little while. Um, and I guess my, my third piece of information, uh, advice would be to, if you're not feeling even really motivated to start, then we have some incredibly put together documentaries. Um, I would suggest three main documentaries. One is, well, you could choose. Um, one is Forks Over Knives, or even probably a little more modern and a little less scientific that still has the same message. It's maybe a bit more enjoyable for a mainstream kind of person to watch. What the Health. Both of them are on Netflix. You could watch both Forks Over Knives and What the Health. They will explain the many health benefits of a plant-based diet, the many dangers you are facing by consuming animal products. And that's some very strong motivation and also ticks a major boss or a major box. I should say though, crosses a major objection off your list of, can I be healthy and do this? We have some, we are in the middle of a crisis, an environmental crisis and animal agriculture is the leading cause of that. The United Nations have said that if everybody, if the best thing that an individual can do is to go vegan, that's the best thing you can do for the environment. We all just do that. This climate crisis is no longer a crisis. And that's something each and every one of us has the ability to do right now. And it's so easy. You go to the supermarket, instead of getting cow's milk, you get almond milk or soy milk or rice milk or coconut milk. Instead of getting meat on your burrito, you get beans. Instead of sour cream, you get guacamole. So it's extremely simple. And then the most important, in my opinion, uh, the one that will really, I hope. So, what was the environmental the documentary? C Cowspiracy? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah, I was going to say Cowspiracy. Mm -hmm. I forgot to actually say what it's called Cowspiracy, the Sustainability Secret. Uh, thank you. And then um, I believe the one that is most important because this is the one that is causing the most amount of violence, the leading cause of violence on our planet by far. You, there are more deaths, more murders in a single day than every single war humanity has faced over all of recorded history. Mm -hmm. More murders in a single day, every single day. Over 8 billion innocent beings who feel pain and suffer, just like human animals do, are being ruthlessly, violently slaughtered. Not humanely. Humane is a word used by industry. There's no humane throat slitting. There's no humane rape. There's no humane child abuse. And there's no humane slaughter of somebody who does not want to die. It's just a word to make people feel good. It's never humane. And if you want to know if it's humane, imagine putting yourself in that situation. Would you think it was humane, somebody bolt gunning you in the head or forcing you into a gas chamber and then chopping your body up into pieces? I literally can't think of anything less humane. And so the documentary that will show you exactly what they, the people who are selling you these products, do desperately not want you to see is called Dominion and it is available at watchdominion.com or on my YouTube channel as well. And it's, it shows what the animals go through from, from birth. I think also, I think the studies have shown that people who go um, vegan, and there's a difference between plant-based and vegan. So vegan, your entire lifestyle changes and you, wear, you don't wear mm -hmm. animals or use any products tested on animals where plant-based is more focused on what you're eating. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's it, it's incredibly imp uh, important that uh, it, studies have shown that people who go plant based for ethical reasons go vegan. They are the ones that stick with it of more course. than the ones I mean, who go for. Look home. at what ha look at what happens when people get on diets. You get on a diet and you get off a diet. That happens all the time. I wouldn't have stayed eating that way if it wasn't for the ethical component. Absolutely not. This becomes about so much more than what's the healthiest diet for the human body? It just happens to be a vegan diet, a whole food plant-based diet. But even if it wasn't and you lost a few years, that losing a couple of years of life would still not justify any of the violence we inflict on other beings. The fact is though, we don't need to eat animals for anything, for any, for any health reason I mean. Not a single person. We have every single nutrient we need that is essential for us available in plants and a B12 supplement, which everybody can, everybody should take, including people who eat animal products. It, it always feels to me um, a little bit like when, you know, we're 
maybe talking to someone for the very first time and they want to understand what happens to animals or they think they might want to understand. They're asking a few questions. They're asking about the ethics of it. And we know it's an important aspect because we know probably, like you said, Alexandra, and research shows that it'll make it stick. It's a bit like the matrix where it's like, okay, do you want do you want the red pill or do you want the blue pill? You mm. really mm. want the full truth. And I feel like a lot of people are like, oh, I'll take half the red pill. You know, it's a little, it's, mm. it's a little daunting. That's why to going think, in through health like going, can sometimes work. Yes. You go in through health, you get them to start eating well, then their hearts are opened because they, they're not they consuming feel great. that right. violence right. and they're feeling better. Right. right. You mentioned that, you know, getting there through health is a great avenue. And absolutely, it's the foot in the door approach. It doesn't matter. Get started however you want. Health is a great start. That's how I started. Um, and one step forward often has the momentum of a second and a third step. There's really not many steps to be vegan. So yes, absolutely. There is a difference between plant-based and vegan, but once you go plant-based and you're already doing it and seeing that you can enjoy this food and that it's good and you're feeling healthy, then when you see the animal stuff, you're like, oh yeah, okay, well, another reason to do this. I'm going to do it. Yep. And that's basically what happens to a lot of us. Um, now, how do I have empathy for people? So easily. I was there once too. I was uninformed. I was ignorant. I didn't know any better. When I did know better, it was still hard for me to change. And I was somebody who, um, you know, I eventually learned a very important and useful technique for behavior change and addiction and things like that. So I'm very lucky to have that. Um, when I see people who, who they either don't know any better, I forgive them for they know not what they do. What am I going to blame this person for? They're a brainwashed member of society, yeah. brainwashed by powerful, powerful corporations who know exactly how to market their, their products of violence. So we're all victims of that propaganda. Meat for protein, dairy for calcium, eggs for omegas, humane slaughter, plants don't feel pain, uh, uh, plants feel pain, fish don't feel pain. Etc. 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 This you you won't be you can't live unless you eat animal products. Um, you won't enjoy food. It's all about veganism. Is all about eating salads. There's just so much crap, and people think that it's true. So how can you blame them? I wouldn't want to go vegan if I believed that long, long, long list of objections either. That's why the goal is to be very direct with somebody. What is your objection? You got to find out. You got to. When they tell you all their crap or they come at you with their insults about veganism, you got to just sift through all that, filter all that out and just find why do you disagree with me? The person I'm talking to, no matter how hostile, no matter how um, in disagreement we are, I have so much compassion for them. I, I want to, Dr. Martin Luther King said, the means we use must be as pure as the ends we seek. We want a compassionate world where everybody has compassion for everyone, animals included. Which means we also need to have compassion, in my opinion, for the slaughterhouse workers, for the factory farm workers, for the people we're talking to who seem very hostile. It's mm -hmm. about adding more compassion to the world. There's already enough hostility. I don't want to add to that. And I've seen through my experience, another Dr. Martin Luther King quote is, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. I'm trying to make every one of those slaughterhouse workers, every one of these hostile people disagreeing with me, love me too. To not aim to change them right then and to leave them alone to after you've spoken to them. And because it's, it's rare that someone's going to say, you know what, you're right. I changed my mind 100%. Yeah. They have to People want to change it. it for themselves. Yeah, their so you own need to leave conviction. them and go, you know, it's totally up to you. This is what where I'm coming from. Um, and then I, th I believe people want to do the right thing. Right. Um, James, awesome. thank you so much for being and sharing in such an eloquent way your life, your experience, and your knowledge. It's very mm -hmm. inspiring even for, for Dotsie and me as vegans to hear what you have to say. We're learning from you also. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate it very much. Um, it's been a really good opportunity to share like you know because it's it's not just about veganism that's obviously the most important thing i'd suggest in all of our lives but yeah there's a lot of human suffering too so i'm really glad that you brought up about my past with my eating disorder and things like that i always feel good when people message me about that saying that a video i made about it or something helped mm -hmm. them mm -hmm. you know it's good to just help reduce suffering wherever you can and use what you've got in your past experiences and that. So thanks for asking me such good questions and giving me the opportunity to open up about it all. We yeah. loved it. It was selfish because we wanted to learn more about you because we know about your activism. <laughs> but, you can call uh, me anytime. <laughs> okay, good. But such great, <laughs> such great advice about sitting with your feelings and going through that. I, I know a lot of our listeners will, will learn a lot and I mean, start practicing. Can I just say one more thing about that actually? Of course. You know, 
Veganism is for the animals. It's to liberate them from their suffering. Observing your sensations and, and accepting whatever in accepting your sensations in whatever form they come is, in my opinion, the most important spiritual practice that a human being can do to liberate themselves from their suffering. It is it is that's why I've just finished my ninth ten day silent meditation course. I've done fifteen hundred hours now, I just counted it the other day. Over fifteen hundred hours of this meditation technique and all it is, it's so simple, it's just observing and accepting your sensations. Mm -hmm. So having some awareness inside of your body, that itch, that tingle, that pressure, that pain, that craving, whatever it is, just being with being with those physical sensations. It's everything we do usually is all out here looking and seeing and spend some time inside of your body too, observing the physical sensations and remaining equanimous with them, which means mm -hmm. not wishing that you were getting good sensations, not wishing that the bad sensations would go away, just whatever they come as, just accept the moment as it is and watch how your life transforms in the most positive way. Allowing. Thank you. You are a true teacher. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was Thanks, a pleasure. James. So thank you so much for tuning in today. If we helped you in any way, then click the subscribe button and let's keep hanging out together. We have so much more to share with you. And if you need more information on actually making the switch for good, please visit us at switchforgood.org for loads of info. And you can subscribe to our mailing list where you will receive all sorts of super cool gifts, discount codes to our very fave dairy-free products, and a lifetime of powerful health tips. So join us on the journey to switch for good. This is the future.